Hello everyone, uh, today's talk will be on the endocrine history and examination. So these are the learning objectives from the tutorial you guys will have or might have already had on uh, the endocrine history and exam. So it's worth taking a look at that because that's probably what they're gonna be looking at uh, when they do the assessments. So I thought we'd start first with just going through the clinical features of the endocrine conditions that are highlighted in your uh, tutorial notes. So the first one is hyperthyroidism and obviously there's hypothyroidism as well. So hyperthyroidism is the result of the overproduction of the hormone thyroxine in the thyroid. So basically you're getting accelerated metabolism uh, and it can be caused by a number of different conditions, which might be worth taking a look at, but I won't go into all of them. Uh, but basically all the symptoms are the result of an accelerated metabolism. So you have weight loss, heat intolerance, tremor, palpitations, anxiety, increased frequency of bowel movements, shortness of breath, and goiter. So I highlighted goiter there because that's kind of like one of the characteristic findings you'd see in hyper and also hypothyroidism. Uh, but basically just to, to remember it, you just remember anything that could cause, uh, be the result of an accelerated metabolism. Um, so in terms of investigations you'd wanna do, uh, you'd wanna do thyroid function tests, uh, and then you would find low TSH and high T4, T3. Uh, you might remember that from uh, the feedback loops uh, diagram you might have seen in your uh, lectures. So it's managed through beta blockers, antithyroid medications, radioactive iodine, and uh, sort of the last resort is the surgical removal of the thyroid, which can then result in hypothyroidism uh, permanently. So hypothyroidism is the underproduction of that hormone, and all the symptoms are basically the result of a reduced metabolism. So weight gain, cold intolerance, lethargy, motor slash intellectual slowing, shortness of breath, constipation, dry skin, and goiter. Investigations are also thyroid function tests, except for sort of the results would be in reverse, so high TSH and low T4, T3. And the management is just you take synthetic thyroxine. So that's sort of a, the diagram, I think, or the table from your notes. And it's worth just like having a look over. It's pretty similar to what I just said, but like a little bit more comprehensive. Uh, we'll go through some of the findings you'd find on examination in a bit. So the clinical features of uh, hyperparathyroidism and hypoparathyroidism is also useful to know, although probably not as high yield. So in terms of the etiology, uh, it's hyperparathyroidism is the result of the overproduction of parathyroid hormone, resulting in derangement of calcium metabolism, because if you remember, uh, parathyroid hormone sort of has an action on calcium. So in terms of your history and exam findings, quite a few different symptoms you can have and his history findings you might uh, look for. So poor sleep, fatigue, myalgia, anxiety, depression, memory loss, and also history of osteoporosis, osteopenia, so like fractures and and also a family history, a uh, way to remember it is stones, bones, groans, and moans. So stones, renal stones, bones, osteopenia, et cetera, groans, uh, nausea, constipation, peptic ulcer, and moans, lethargy, drowsiness, confusion, et cetera. In terms of investigations, you might see elevated serum, calcium, and parathyroid hormone. So hypoparathyroidism is relative or absolute deficiency of parathyroid hormone synthesis and secretion. So in terms of history and exam findings, we might see malnutrition, malabsorption, diarrhea, muscle twitches, spasms, cramps, paresthesia, numbness, tingling, poor memory, anxiety, dry hair, brittle nails, cataracts. Uh, you might see alcoholism in the history as well as the presence of risk factors. So thyroid surgery is a big one. Um, in terms of investigations, it's sort of the reverse. So decreased serum calcium and parathyroid hormone can help diagnose it. So two other conditions that are important, Cushing's and Addison's. So Cushing's is sort of the clinical manifestation of pathological hypercortisolism. 
So in terms of history and exam findings, so the big one is the presence of risk factors. So classically, steroid use uh, is a big one to focus on and also sort of adenomas and carcinomas of your adrenal and pituitary. Uh, so it results in these sort of symptoms like round face or moon face, buffalo hump, central adiposity, so uh, extra fat, uh, proximal muscle wasting and weakness, hypertension, edema, acne, and menstrual irregularities. Uh, and it's classically diagnosed through uh, the dexamethasone suppression test, which is worth looking at. That's what the table below is about. I won't go into detail about it, but it's worth having a look at. Uh, Addison's disease is the impaired synthesis and secretion of all steroids produced in the adrenal gland. It's kind of the opposite. So history and exam, again, presence of risk factors is a big one. So if you've got a significant autoimmune history or female sex uh, predispose you to Addison's, those uh, symptoms you might find, fatigue, anorexia, weight loss, hyperpigmentation, abdo pain, muscle weakness, nausea, vomiting, and postural hypotension. So just quickly, a couple other ones that might sort of be tied into endocrine. So there's diabetes. So either type one or type two. So type one is uh, when you have an absolute insulin deficiency. Uh, and type two is sort of this condition progressive disorder where you have deficits in insulin secretion as well as increased insulin resistance uh, and so the typical findings you'd have a polyuria polydipsia nocturia and loss of weight and you might also see those signs of your macrovascular and microvascular complications like peripheral neuropathy uh, and i think classically retinopathy is also a finding you might see uh, so it's also worth sort of having a look into diabetes as well uh, and then also, I think just on your notes, they also mentioned briefly acromegaly and hypopituitary. Again, probably useful to have a look at, but I don't think those ever came up. So in terms of your endocrine history, so common presenting complaints that might require an endocrine history. So any appetite and weight changes, disturbed defecation, sweating, changes in hair distribution, lethargy, skin changes, pigmentation, stature, loss of libido, erectile dysfunction, menstruation, polyuria, and a lump in the neck could all require an endocrine history. And there's a bunch of more symptoms you might also consider because uh, metabolism has a big effect just generally on the body. So it's often useful to do a few screening questions for within, from the endocrine history in order to rule in or rule out certain conditions, but even when you're doing other types of uh, histories. So in terms of the history of presenting a complaint, what to focus on. So you can work through your uh, WQQAABICE. Uh, adapt the question to the presenting complaint is a big uh, important aspect that you should do. So like if you're asking about shortness of breath, you don't really ask it out of 10. That's more of a pain thing. So instead you could ask about what they could do versus what they can now. So for example, could they go on a long walk and now they can't walk at all and they can't exert themselves? So that's a better way of asking. And it's also easier for a patient to answer. Uh, and also an important thing to do is use your history presenting complaint to generate a differential list of conditions. So like what conditions could this presenting symptom be caused by? So think if an endocrine condition could, could cause a symptom, often it can. So then it, you go on to your cluster questions and your systems review. So if you've kind of generated that differential list, this is how you work through and determine which ones are the most likely. So you focus your cluster questions around the different endocrine conditions. So that's why I went through those endocrine conditions because it's useful to ask about those clinical features so that you can kind of get a picture of what the most likely conditions are. So when you get more confident, you can limit those questions to those that are uh, help narrow down your differential list so you're not just listing off all the questions you can start off with that but hopefully you can work towards asking more targeted questions especially when you have to ask questions under time conditions uh, and then you should also screen for risk factors in the social medication and family history uh, so this is a table uh, it's kind of a summary of the different presentations uh, so it's worth just having a quick skim over if you forget what to look for. 
So now the endocrine examination. So you always start off uh, with any exam with general inspection. So you're gonna assess alertness where the patient is sitting, if they're in distress, any aids they might have nearby, especially in mobility aids, uh, any drips, venipuncture, catheters, um, if they have any um, urine containers nearby, any visible signs of pathology. Uh, you might also see some symptoms uh, from the condition as well. Uh, so it's also worth taking a look at that. Then you sort of start um, distilling work more um, inwards. So you start off with your hands. So in terms of findings, you might see in the hands and hypothyroidism, you might see a fine tremor, oncolysis, palmar edema, a side that's supposed to say sinus tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, hypothyroidism, you might see some peripheral cyanosis, palmar crease pallor, yellow discoloration, slow pulse because of reduced cardiac output because, uh, you know, you've got reduced metabolism. So Cushing's, you might see increased skin fold thickness. Uh, moving up to the arms and hyper hyperthyroidism, you might see muscle weakness as well as brisk reflexes. In hypothyroidism, you might have slow reflexes uh, and you might also see uh, symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, in the face with hyperthyroidism, you might see warm, sweaty skin. Uh, you might see exothalmos uh, and proptosis. You might see thyroid stare, lid retraction, lid gag, and ophthalmoplegia. In hypothyroidism, you might see cold, dry skin skin discoloration, thickened hair, hair thinning slash eyebrow loss, periorbital edema, uh, exhalmaza, and tongue swelling. And with Cushing's, remember classically, you see that moon-shaped face as well as acne. You might also have uh, some redness and visual field disturbances. So in terms of the thyroid inspection uh, examination, it's it can get pretty uh, detailed. So I've got a link there where you can look through it and get it in more detail, but just generally you go through inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. Uh, and one of the most important aspects of the thyroid examination is when you see a lump, uh, you do the swallowing test. So if it moves on swallowing um, and it's an exaggerated movement, you might consider that it's pathological and moves on poking tongue uh, so you can determine whether it's a thyroglossal cyst or a goiter. So just in that flow chart below. So moving on to the chest. So in hyperthyroidism, you do heart auscultation for signs of flow murmurs of congestive heart failure. And in hypothyroidism, you might uh, find signs of pericardial effusion or pleural effusion. Moving to the abdomen, in Cushing's, you might see abdominal purple striae. So feel some palpable adrenal masses or a palpable hepatomegaly. So you can feel the liver uh, or percuss the liver border and it's larger than normal. Moving down to the legs, in hyperthyroidism, you might have pretibiomyxedema, muscle weakness and brisk reflexes. Hypothyroidism, you might have non-pitting edema and slow reflexes. And in Cushing's, you might also have edema as well as bruising and poor wound healing, which is also the easy way to remember that is it's similar to what happens when someone takes a steroid. So just quickly, hypoparathyroidism has a couple of signs that are worth knowing. So there's Chovtex signs. You just tap gently over the facial nerve and that results in facial twitching. In Trossal signs, you inflate the blood pressure cuff above their systolic blood pressure. And this produces this sort of funny hand movement that we call involuntary carpopedal tetany of the hand. And that occurs within two minutes. Uh, so sort of that bright diagram. Just quickly uh, summarizing a case. So it's pretty useful to have an idea of how to summarize a case that isn't just reading off the notes you've written down as you've been taking the history or the exam. So, I think useful framework for doing it is you start off with uh, the patient's basic details and the presenting complaint. So for example, you might say, John Smith is a 50 year old male presenting with generalized fatigue over the past month in the background of XYZ conditions. 
then you want to present your relevant history of presenting complaint details. So you expand on that. So you go, the fatigue is constant. It's been actively worsening since onset. And you explain those details you've determined in your history of presenting complaint. Then as you move down to your systems review and cluster questions, you want to focus on relevant positives and negatives. So you don't need to necessarily work through every time they said no. You just say maybe uh, there was no significant urinary uh, history and then you just move on. But you focus on the pertinent findings, especially uh, to the differential list you've uh, determined. So for example, the patient has had a weight loss of three kilos during this period with XYZ, but denied XYZ. So it's important to present relevant social medication and family history that help narrow down your differential list. Then explain uh, any exam findings that were unremarkable, if there were any, or mention any signs found on examination and any relevant negatives that, again, help you work towards uh, a diagnosis. Then resummarize the pertinent details of the case slash exam and present a differential list, although I think at the year two level, you're not expected to present a differential list. So maybe don't do that at this point, but it is worth to sort of understand that that's where you're working towards. And um, if you formulate your summary in a manner that sort of points towards certain differentials, it, it'll probably look pretty good when you're doing your OSCEs. So just in general, focus on information synthesis rather than simply retelling the history and exam. And often you don't have a whole lot of time when you're doing the OSCE station. So uh, focusing more on information synthesis is also going to impress them more and it's going to be uh, a lot quicker to work through. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to send us a message.